You're watching Beyond Markets, where we bring you up to speed on development outcomes in Africa. I'm Kenneth Ibomo, and I'll be taking you on the show today. Uh, on today's show, we'll discuss how Nigeria's Kama 2020 bill will affect uh, not-for-profit organizations and civil society organizations. Uh, you can let us know what you think about what we discuss on this topic today. Uh, the hashtag to use is Beyond Markets. Uh, you, so, you can also hit me up on my handle. That's at Kenneth Ibomo. Now, while some say Nigeria scored a major point in reforming its business ecosystem with the new Companies and Allied Matters Act of 2020, some others, however, have viewed the provisions as it relates to not-for-profit organizations as a poison chalice. Uh, Tommy Vincent, uh, the managing partner at Ivory Solicitors, joins me now as we discuss uh, this topic today. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, sir. And uh, I'd like to first get your thoughts on the Karma 2020 uh, Act as a whole. Thank you very much, Ken, for having me on your show. Uh, right, um, to tell you what, uh, the 2020 Kama actually it's a landmark epoch-making uh, legislation that goes a long way, or should go a long way to solve some of the uh, some of the problems you have with public uh, company administration in Nigeria and uh, generally the oversighting of. Um, what we call the regulatory framework for uh, business endeavors in Nigeria. Uh, some of the things that you have in that, that new law is introduction of single uh, membership company that whereby you can have just one man having a business outfit and making a limited liability company. Uh, they need to do away with secretaryship in uh, small companies. You can have limited cap partnership. You have so many things that come into it reduction of the fees, uh, the regulatory framework for um, dispensation of um, um, annual returns and things like that, you know, make that law, all this attribute, make that law a law that robustly covers or puts um, the best interest of the business community yeah, to the fore. So I think it's a welcome development as it were. All right, but looking at how far-reaching uh, the impact of this uh, this act will, will be, I'd like to you, know, you to speak on the importance of inclusiveness in the process of, of getting it together. Yeah, but um, thank you very much. Um, the law, as it were, uh, when it was being done, uh, to a large extent, the the CAC, that is the Corporate Affairs Commission, uh, quite, to my knowledge, uh, tried as much as it could to bring in all the stakeholders to engage in the making or the over the, the remaking of that law because this law had actually been there since 1990, comma, but just that there was a need in terms of time, about 30 years framework, you know, had gone past and there was need for amendments, or need for adjustment as it were. And the Corporate Affairs Commission, to my to, to the way I saw it, did all it could to bring in people, to bring in stakeholders, to have public hearings and even the the, the amendments or what I, what you call Kama uh, 2020 was actually uh, put on the website of CAC for about two or three years with highlights highlights in green of possible amendments and every um, move to discuss it at National Assembly was highlighted. So uh, it just probably be the stakeholders did not take it as serious as it we should add when it was in that stage. So I cannot really say that CST or the uh, regulatory authority involved, the Ministry of Trade and Commerce, did not do as much in terms of letting people know about this law when it was in the making process. All right, but 30 years uh, since uh, the initial law was in place, and we've seen quite a lot has happened in the, in the, in the business, in the world of the business world. We've seen, you know, um, um, different companies evolve into the, in, in, in many ways based on technology and a whole lot. But I understand that the act, even as it is right now, it's not perfect, and there'll still be need for that continuous engagement and reviews for, so that it could better reflect what's the reality on ground with, when you look at how, uh, how the landscape in business is changing. Yeah, Ken, the, uh, the, the absolute truth is that no matter the crime, no matter the country, uh, law is regulating the human being. Human beings are dynamic. Um, whatever is it, law at the point of arrival will meet a, a static, I mean, it's going to address an issue that can be called static. 
but human beings are never static. They are dynamic. They are they keep moving on. They keep doing things. So that's why legislation all over the world are meant to be updated, to be uh, drafted, or to be adjusted, uh, to be amended as well to address exigencies, development, and as well. So this law can never be called perfect as well. Can never be called perfect because, I mean, for instance, just as when the law was coming in, we have a situation whereby COVID came in and then they become uh, what you have as new normal and become the reality of the day. And so how do you address those issues of virtual meetings, virtual um, executive meetings, board meetings, and things like that, you know? So it's a going forward, as it were, going forward, so yes, it's not totally exhaustively covering every aspect of what you have today, but at least a step has been taken. Um, you know, the only thing that in this part of the world, amendments take a time, it takes a while, it takes a while to come to be. So um, if it took 30 years to have one done, I mean, you can imagine how long we might be looking at the next one. Or say in England, company act is a, reg a regularly adjusted thing, regularly adjusted. You have so many amendments, so many updates of the law. So that's just it. We'll do, we'll get to that. So I hope that the regulatory authority will know that as to where the next two, three years, we need to adjust again to address our new realities. All right, now, so now let's get into the suspicions and why would some segments of society view this as a poison chalice? Yeah, yeah, um, that, yes, I mean, basically, where I've seen sentimental uh, deductions or probably suspicions will be in the part F mainly, which has to do with non for profit organizations. And um, basically, it's uh, the faith based organization that have been at the forefront of the opera um, because of the perception that they are non-regulated bodies. They cannot be because of the faith-based toga. And so that comes with, that comes, I mean, understandably so, because for a long time, the, uh, the oversight regime for that operation, for that sphere, have been so much of um, uh, lagging behind. Uh, they have been left to do a lot of things on their own. Um, basically, you find that, you know, in Nigeria for a long time, is uh, what we call the part A and the part B. The part A used to be the limited liability company, the part B used to be the uh, the business names regime and things like that had been more or less focused on by the uh, by Corporate Affairs Commission and uh, living to a large extent on regulated on on hindered operations in the part C, which has to do with uh, which had to do with the incorporated trustees for a long time. So you know, uh, many people that are operating in that sphere have taken the the absurdity as normal. But now that the Corporate Affairs Commission woke up to the responsibility to oversight that sphere, uh, there was some opera like, look, it cannot be done. But the truth is that when you come to part F now, which has become part F, part C before part F now, uh, that sphere is talking about you as a um, an altruistic organization. Uh, you are coming with the sentiment that you want to help humanity. You want to relieve the government in terms of their operations in the sphere of, say, health, in the sphere of um, engaging people in spirituality, which is religion, in the sphere of culture. So what you're saying you're going to do is that you want to help the community. And once you come with that, the law says that you cannot even be uh, registered as a body. You cannot be registered as a body because registering as a body is more or less like a breach of your fundamental human rights. You have the freedom of association, unrestricted association. So what usually happens is that the government will say, okay, pick some people who in this sphere, uh, who amongst you can be seen as the ones that would be the custodian, not the owners, the custodians of what you are doing, so that when we need to see them, we need to ask these people about you. These are the people we we'll go to, and those people are called the trustees. And those people then will approach the corporate affairs commission and say that we want to be incorporated on behalf of this community. Those 
those trustees are perpetually, even though by reason of technicality of law, they are the owners of the properties of the organization in the technical sense, because they are the one that property is probably domiciled in or with. But really, the, the accountability leaves them that they must be responsible to the community. So now, if that's what you say, government would not tax that organization. Government will lead the organization to do a lot of things that they want to do. But government has that interest, has that ability to ask, give account of what you're doing on behalf of that community. Now, many of us, many people in that sphere do not understand this. They think that trusteeship is ownership. They think that trusteeship is like you are the owner of that affair, you are the leader of that. It's not the leadership position, it's actually a stewardship position. So right now, section 839, that people are shouting about or talking about, is actually saying that as a trustee, if you do not, you are not seen to be above board, the Corporate Affairs Commission asks the oversight to ask you to step aside, to do some things so that they can see that the integrity of the organization is not, is not, um, is not affected. All right, Mr. Vincent, I needed to hold that thought for a second. We'll take a quick break. Then when we return, we'll find out more about this uh, Section 839 and the provisions uh, and as to how it affects uh, not-for-profit organizations. Uh, we'll bring you more on Beyond Markets after the break. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're watching Beyond Markets and we've been speaking to Tommy Vincent, a managing partner at Ivy Solicitors. And he's been breaking down the Kama 2020 bill as to how it impacts the not for profit organizations. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Tommy Vincent, I'd, I'd like you to take, let's talk, take the issue around the areas of checks and balances. Uh, um, you definitely, I understand that just before even this law uh, came into being, into, in, uh, the, the advent of the law came into being, uh, there were attempts by some faith based organizations to kind of self-regulate uh, or more or less check each other, uh, each other's excesses? Yeah, there were. There were. It's it just that uh, because of that uh, uh, space, you find that many people feel, um, or many operators in that space feel that they are both, uh, there's usually that personality clashes, um, a sense of, you know, um, a better, or let's say, ego, ego trippings and things like that. Uh, which made that it was difficult to really put um, structure to that attempt to do a self-regulation. Um, so it becomes a challenge or became a challenge. Um, but you see what the Kama had done now is that uh, the framework has been set in place so that even if you want to say that you do not want to be self-regulated as by your organization, there's a law that regulates you now, which enables you to see the highlights of what you have to engage in to be seen as doing the right thing. And the attempt, um, some really, some went ahead and they, they succeeded to, to an extent. But uh, I cannot really say that we have the one that hugely succeeded because um, it, it's more or less, there was no law, like, there was no legality that backed it. So at the end of the day, there was a lot of reason to walk away from that self-regulation, th thinking that it was more or less um, overkilling. But now the law is there, and anybody that wants to say you self-regulate yourself or you comply, either way, it's there. Yeah, because when you look at these organizations, like you rightly said, at the heart of all the Kama Bill is trying to do is to get some level of uh, accountability and transparency in place for both private and, uh, you know, public enterprises, you know, and, uh, well, but then why are we seeing this much kickback and cognitive dissonance? So, uh, so what, 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 is, what happened was that for many people, there was a sense of impunity. Uh, they found the thought that um, uh, being in that space left you with um, being the Lord and master of that um, dispensation. You know, because when you go to register as a non-for-profit, because of the low level of oversight, low level of regulatory oversight, uh, they found the thought that it could, could operate without any question. 
Uh, and in fact, not just like I was saying, not just about faith-based organizations, uh, even some people at some point in time, um, there are people they, they, they went ahead for their own private businesses. They decided to go the route of or the route of registering it as a non-profit organization. Now and thinking that that will give them access to funds, to things that they could do, and you know, it, it, it's like nobody says that you should not do business. Uh, but if you want to engage in business with that platform of non-for-profit space, it simply means that no matter what you get in that place, it has to be plowed back into that um, that business and to make it grow further for the benefit of the community. And in that sense, you as a founder, even if you are so powerful, you cannot be seen. And the moment you make yourself a trustee, the law says that you cannot even earn income from that trusteeship. You cannot earn income at all from it because that gives you uh, like integrity issues. So you can only be an executive in that sense, not a, a trustee. Now, but many people who do not have the understanding, probably out of ignorance or sense of ego tripping, went ahead to become as well as trustee as, as, as much as um, the executives. So they were earning income, they were making as a private business outfit, which largely was wrong, was wrong. So, so much so in the faith-based organizations as well. So there were a lot of challenges about integrity, non-accountability. Uh, you have even sometimes uh, non-faith-based organization who got donor fund from foreign donors and who could not account for it because the so-called executive director is also the trustee who is earning income and a lot of things were wrong. So now that the law came, there was bound to be like opposition. People who felt ruffled, their space is being challenged. So to that extent, it was understandable that ignorance was also full in the opposition. Ignorance in the sense that nobody told you what you need to, you need to have known earlier in terms of operations. Nobody said you cannot make profit, but you cannot plow out that profit, but you plow back. You can do so much, so, but that space is a non-for-profit. You cannot say you are going to end the income as a trustee. So really, the law is not against operations of, um, of non-for-profit. Non it's not against, it's just that regulatory framework has to be tightened up. And those who are coming against it is largely because they have not taken time to know what that space until they have just been following the fray without understanding the way. All right, but some have picked holes in uh, the ambiguity in some of the provisions. For example, um, some, for some of the civil society organizations, say if the CAC uh, reasonably believes that there, there has been fraud, uh, misconduct, or mismanagement, you know, quoting that uh, uh, the reasonable, and how, how, how do you prove that when, that when something is believed to be reasonable, in, and, and how can you prove that in, in, in a place? And they feel that this is just the CAC uh, having the whims and, and caprices to just willy nilly take over some of these organizations. Yeah, I, I see, I hear that point, and I, and I, and I think it's not far-fetched. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, Section 839, if I may quote, says, the commission may by order suspend the trustees of an association and appoint an interim manager or managers to manage the affairs of an association where it reasonably believes that there is or has been misconduct. Uh, people are frowned on the word reasonable, or because they said it could be it could be abused. It can uh, for some reasons. Yes, I agree. But you have to also understand the objectivity or objectiveness of reasonableness now, uh, because in law, reasonable is not just um, skewed in your favor. You, it has to be objective. Of course, objectivity becomes a debatable issue, you know, in jurisprudence of law. But in the real sense of it. Uh, if you go to the, that law, Part G, which many of us have not adverted our minds to, Part G of that comma says that there's an establishment of an administrative proceeding committee. And this committee, as you know, is, is open committee that whoever feels like their rights have been um, injured or their rights has been breached by whatever the CSC wants to do, 
can go to that community. And by the way, in the larger context, the law court is not short. Is not short. So if you feel that there's an arbitrariness with what the RG registry is trying to do, no law, there's no law in Nigeria that says you cannot approach the court to stop the RG from doing what he wants to do. But you know, if you read that law very objectively, you will see that you know the uh, the purpose of that is not to be punitive. It's just to protect the integrity of the assets of that organization. Of course, politically, it can be motivated. But I agree with you that in this in our climb, we can use the law to, to suggest that uh, there's a political motivation. But beyond your suspicion, objective read objective analysis of that law, leave it. I mean, if it was not like you have uh, a proposition in terms of uh, political or whatever, that law allows an a, 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 an objective, uh, you know, um, oversight of that organization, so that the trustees are on their toes. They know that not does not does the the, the the RG can can, can um, set in motion the process of their removal. Even members of the organization can, on their own, call for that removal, where they think that there is a breach of integrity, trust, and transparency. So what are we looking at? That's why I say it. Yeah, but some question why it should involve the Corporate Affairs Commission, but usually there's a case of fraud or mismanagement and the law enforcement agencies should be brought into play into place or, or they should go and seek redress in, in a court of arbitration. Again, yeah, let, let me put it this way. Let's start with this. You see, um, uh, let's, let's start from the point of the constitutional right, the fundamental human right that you as a person have. You have the right to engage, right to associate, right to have, you know, uh, assembly, right to do everything. And that right cannot be regulated by anybody so long you are not against the law. It's a fundamental human right. Now, the point is that a group of people can meet for 20 years without, being reg without, without saying that they want to register their trustees. They can meet for 30 years. You can have home fellowship, everything. You can have it. You can have a group of uh, you can you can be together. You can you can do a lot of things without going the route of saying we want to have our our our, our trustees registered or incorporated. But you see, the moment you say you want to do that, the moment you say you want to do that, it's not in your position to be saying that I want to be regulated by this kind of law or not. It's a choice. Stay away from registering your trusteeship, or when you are going there abide by the rules, tenets, and regulations of that engagement. And I don't know why we think that, you know, um, it has to be suspiciously looked at in the sense that, oh, uh, they're trying to muzzle out. No, they're not trying to muzzle you. If you want to engage in that space, just see that you comply with the laws. If you are not ready for it, stay until when you are ready for it. The same thing, if you want to take your company to the stock exchange, to the stock market, if there are rules, you can stay as a private limited liability company for years and nobody questions you so long you are paying your tax, doing the regular thing. But the moment you say, I want to go public with this, there are things you have to do that at that point in time, you cannot say, um, I remember I, I, I was I was, I was um, um, advising. Hello? Ah, I was I was advising um, some some limited liability company some time ago, and they decided to go public. And I had to call the management and said, "You are going public. Whatever you are doing in this boardroom will not just be you again. It has to be the public looking at this boardroom, your affairs, your meetings, and everything." Of course, you know they somehow they didn't understand this. And at a point in time, it boomeranged because the public, there was a public inquiry that led to even the sacking of the board. You know, it, you cannot, you cannot question, you cannot, uh, it, it's it's a given. So I do not understand why I sympathize, I, 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 I sympathize with the feeling that now somebody wants to come and take it, uh, peep into your space. But the truth is that it, it's a given that regulatory authority should have the power to do the job that they're meant to do. Regardless of whether I call it faith-based or not faith-based. 
And by the way, that there is no law in Nigeria specifically for faith-based organization. Nigeria is a secular state. It means that um, when in that part F, every organization that say, we don't want to go the way of profit is registered on that. So they all have trustees, a club, let's say a Koyi club, Lagos Country Club, is registered on that part. The, um, uh, what you call it, the uh, Sickle Cell Association of Nigeria is registered under that. Or let's say the Election Monitoring Committee uh, Association is registered under that. So you have a church as well, is registered under that. A faith-based university registered under that. A mosque that uh, a, a, a Muslim religion, I mean, a Muslim organization registered under that. But you see what? A mosque will not be registered. Why? Because a mosque is just an association of people who are just worshiping God. So, and they can stay unregistered forever. And nobody will say that anything wrong. So you can have a house fellowship of Christians too, who are not registered forever. But the moment they say, we want to take it into a corporate status, then they must comply with the requirement of that status as long as the law has given it. All right, then. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Still a lot of sticking points to look at it, but I'm afraid that's all the time that we have uh, to take this conversation. Uh, Tommy Vincent is the managing partner at Ivory Solicitors talking about how the Kama 2020 bill affects a not-for-profit organization. And that's it on Beyond Markets. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the show for me and the team. Enjoy the rest of your day.